Today I want to take a look at one of the long-time members of my computer collection that is... Oh, is my lens dirty? Ah, that looks much better. This is an iMac G4. Released in 2002, it was the successor to the very popular CRT-based iMac G3. With its unique styling, this computer has become an icon of design. But I think this is a very interesting computer for completely different reasons. I would even say it's historically significant. But before we take it out and look at that, there are a couple of interesting things I want to point out on the box. If we take a look at some of the artwork on this box, we'll see this rather unsightly rendition of the Apple logo. This has been in my collection for many years, and it wasn't until I started working on this video that I finally figured out why it looks so weird. The giant Apple logo on the side is a tight zoom of the Apple logo on the front of the computer. Since the computer's base is a hemisphere and this was shot parallel to the ground, not perpendicular to the logo, it's short and weird looking. I know this is an odd thing to mention, but this has bothered me for years, and I finally figured it out. So, I figured I'd share. Elsewhere on the box, the original purchase price for this computer can be seen, $2,000. This was certainly not a cheap computer, especially considering that this isn't the higher-end Power Mac G4 or the G4 Cube. Now, let's get this thing open and take a look at it. It's kind of funny I still have this box. I got this long before I was ever a collector, and the only reason I still have it is because it made for such a convenient way to store the computer. It's so weirdly shaped, it would have gotten broken if I'd stored it like most things. One final interesting thing about the box, the original hardware configuration can be found on several labels on it. Oddly, it's also etched on the bottom of the computer, kind of like the capacity on an iPod. Now here it is, the iMac G4, with its original accessories. The Pro Speakers, the Pro Keyboard, and the Pro Mouse. Man, Apple really wanted you to feel good about this thing after dropping two grand on it. Everything is pro. I would like to especially mention the keyboard, though. Ignore the fact that my original example here is severely yellowed and a bit broken. This is THE keyboard for this computer. There seems to be a misconception that the wired version of one of these is the keyboard for this computer. While it does work and function in the same way, it's not the keyboard this computer would have originally had. This keyboard should also not be confused with the G3 keyboard. The G3 keyboard is missing the separated arrow keys and lacks the ability to change volume and eject the disk drive. So, what's so special about some early 2000s Mac? The peripherals are USB, it runs an early version of Apple's current operating system, and it's not really all that great. Well, most people would go to the styling of this computer as being special, but frankly, I don't really care. The goofy swing arm on mine is loose and needs to be adjusted now, and really, once you have it in place, how often do you need to move it? No. My interest in this computer is for purely technical reasons. Let's get it running and start by listing some of the specs for this machine. This is the middle 17-inch model, which has a 1440 x 900 TFT display. I think this display still holds up very well for today. It looks pretty good in person. Driving the display is an NVIDIA GeForce 4 MX with 32 megabytes of video memory. This computer was upgraded to 512 megabytes of system memory and has the larger 80 gigabyte hard drive. But most importantly, the 800 megahertz G4 processor. This computer has a power PC processor. It is a member of one of the last lines of successful consumer computers to be made without a CPU based on the Intel x86 architecture. Now there have been some more recent attempts at this, such as Windows RT with ARM, but those haven't been able to make a dent in the x86 dominance. So I find this computer to be very interesting for that reason alone. Now the G4 wasn't the last computer made with a non-x86 CPU, obviously the G5s exist. And the PowerPC chip even lived beyond Apple as well. It found life in the Big 3 lineup of the 7th generation of video game consoles. The PowerPC architecture still lives on today, just not in mainstream computers. I find it fascinating though, looking at it from the perspective of the 80s. There was no victor for THE CPU yet then. IBM was betting on the winning horse with the 8088, Commodore was plugging along with the 6502 from 1975, Tandy was stretching the Z80 for all they could in all of their computers, and Apple was moving to use the Motorola 68K. 
So seeing the PowerPC CPU in these later Apple computers, to me, is a look at the end of an era of diversity. I'm not saying it's better when everyone is using different CPUs, but it certainly helped drive competition. Now what CPU a computer has doesn't really matter to the end user. They only care about the end result, which is what software it runs. So what is using this computer like? It was in the first generation of computers to ship with OS X. So if you use a Mac now, it will feel at least somewhat familiar. I'm not really a Mac person. I've always been in the camp of the lockdown ecosystem being a hindrance. I do own a newer Mac though, since I plan to get into mobile and iOS development at some point, but I only ever use it with Linux personally. The early models of the iMac G4 also shipped with Mac OS 9 installed, which users were likely to have software for already. But we'll get to that more in a bit. At this point, I want to show the OS running and using the computer, but Apple so kindly decided to use a mini VGA port on the rear, and I'm not buying an adapter to connect just this computer, so you'll be seeing off-screen video from here. OS X was comparatively streamlined compared to OS 9, and the user interface was meant to feel more friendly. Even though the fluffier window decorations added overhead to the UI, I distinctly remember being envious of it as a Windows user. Windows XP had a significant UI overhaul as well, but it wouldn't be until Windows Vista was released five years after OS X that Windows would look anything like that. But that also brought headaches of the UI adding overhead to the system, and OS X did it sooner and faster. OS X also introduced a feature copied by many third-party applications for Windows, the Dock. A simple alternative to the taskbar that didn't do much other than act as shortcuts in these earlier versions of OS X. But it would stick around and evolve into something much more complex as Apple would keep adding features to it. But it doesn't matter how good your OS is. Consumers want to run the applications they need, and if you don't have it, they won't buy it. Microsoft Office was available for these systems. It seems weird and somewhat unfair to me as a Linux user that Mac got and continues to get Office, but if Microsoft sold Office for Linux, most companies would probably switch their users over to Linux to avoid paying OS licenses for Windows. But unlike modern Intel Macs, you didn't have a way of running most Windows applications if there weren't ports available. Parallels wouldn't be designed to run on non-Intel CPUs, and full VMs like QEMU weren't very performant on here. And Boot Camp definitely didn't exist on the PowerPC Macs and would have been useless anyway. So if you wanted to play games, you were reliant on native releases and ports. But Mac has always had a significant enough user base to have a fair number of games made available for them. Let's start with a game released just a year before this computer that is meant for a PowerPC CPU. American McGee's Alice. A full 3D game that really shows off what this computer can do. Though... This is a port of the Windows version done by Aspire, who has done quite a few Mac ports. There aren't any performance problems as a result, and the game just plays fine. This is also the newest Mac game I have. Since it really isn't my focus, out of all the games I have in my collection, very few are Mac, and only a small fraction of those are made for a computer this new. So let's see how this computer can handle running an older game the oldest Mac games I have, going back to what I've run on my monochrome Mac Classic 2. Which means it's time to talk about one of my other favorite features of this computer, just how good it is at backwards compatibility thanks to the classic environment. Being a 2002 model, this computer shipped with Mac OS 9 installed alongside the shiny new version of OS X. The classic environment is able to boot this installation on top of OS X as a compatibility layer to run old software in the new OS. Since OS X was a large technical departure with its new Unix-like kernel, there was no hope that Mac OS 9 or older applications would run natively on it. So let's put this compatibility to the test with a game originally released in 1989, SimCity. The iMac G4 doesn't have a floppy drive, but it can use one over USB. So let's see this classic environment in action. Well, all right, here's the bad news. Due to the history of the three and a half inch floppy disk not falling in Apple's favor, this 1.44 megabyte drive is incapable of reading these early disks because they are meant to spin at a variable speed. But there were some Mac games released on the 1.44 megabyte disks. So if we try out Scrabble here, we can install it, and it actually runs just fine. Scrabble is 
easy though, so let's try something a little more challenging. Doom. Being on CD, this is a much easier game to get on this computer. But when you try to run it, you'll see it has a bit of a problem. There are a couple of solutions to this. One is to set your Mac to 640x480. The graphics drawing is only updating part of the display rapidly, so you want to try and run the game in that area only. Another option is a different feature of the backwards compatibility of this system that I find great. You can choose your startup disk in System Preferences and change it to the installation of Mac OS 9. Then when you restart the computer, it boots into the same installation of Mac OS 9 that the classic environment uses. All of your software and files from OS X are also accessible, but you won't be able to run anything that isn't backwards compatible. From here though, Doom and many other games or software with compatibility problems should run fine. Keep in mind, should. I tried to install After Dark 4.0 on here, and all I get is a broken system, so your mileage may vary. Well, that's about everything I wanted to cover about this computer. It is much more than just a pretty case. I don't welcome the idea of a new processor type competing with x86 right now, but I do miss the era when there were alternatives like the PowerPC. And even though it's not an OS I really want to use on a daily basis, it's still cool to see the origins of the current operating system that Apple is still using, and in its beginning, how well thought out the backwards compatibility was. I hope you guys enjoyed this look at the iMac G4, and I'll see you next time. And here's a quick bit of final information for my regular viewers. I hope this video looked quite a bit better than it usually does because it was not shot with the Nikon D5300 that I usually use. No. I am now shooting on a Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera 4K. It's a uh, whole other level of camera, so yeah, videos should look much better from now on.